Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's ContainerJournal.com webinar, brought to you by TechStrong and FusionAuth. My name is Cody J. Brown. I'm the host of TechStrong Learning. We have an exciting webinar ahead, but first, I have just a couple of housekeeping notes. First, today's session is being recorded. So if you miss any of our discussion or you'd like to share with a friend or rewatch, the on-demand recording will be made available shortly after we conclude our live session today. If you have any questions, we do want you to send those in using the Q&A tab, which can be found on the right side of your screen. That's also where you're going to find the chat tab, where we want you to engage with one another, engage with us, let us know your thoughts throughout today's program. And finally, before we conclude, we will be giving away four $25 Amazon gift cards, so be sure to stick around till the very end. So our topic of this webinar is Auth Considerations for Kubernetes, and I'm joined by Dan Moore, Head of Developer Relations at Fusion Auth. Dan, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm going to let you take it from here. Thank you so much, Cody, and thanks everyone for joining us. So as Cody mentioned, we're talking about Kubernetes and authentication and authorization today. So if you have questions, just a bit of housekeeping, go ahead and put it in the Q&A tab. And as Cody mentioned, we'll be recording this video and making it available later. The slides will also be available later if you reach out and ask for them. So what we're going to talk about today is briefly what is auth, because it's a term that means different things to different folks, and it's always worth setting the, uh, setting the stage, so to speak. Then we're going to talk about the different kinds of workloads that you might consider running in Kubernetes and how auth interfaces with, with each of those. And then we'll talk about the three different types of auth or kinds of auth that you might encounter in Kubernetes. Finally, or uh, second, um, second to last, we'll talk about briefly the steps for how to use an OIDC to control access to your Kubernetes cluster. And that will be kind of at the layer of like pods or deployments, not applications on top of it. But there's a really nice way to use OIDC ID tokens to control access. And then finally, we're going to end with how do you handle tokens, which are prime me, primary means of authentication, um, how do you handle those tokens at the boundary around your microservices? So we'll kind of walk through four different scenarios that you'll be able to use and some of the trade-offs between each of these. So briefly, what is auth? So auth is really three things. There is authentication, which is who you are. And this can be in an offline or online context. So an offline context might be me going to the post office to pick up my mail and presenting an, a government issued ID, a driver's license or something else. And so that ID, when it's examined by a postal worker, tells them that I'm Dan Moore and it authenticates me. In an online scenario, it tends to be something you know, something you have, something you are, or conceivably where you are those all help identify who you are and often with um, online systems it's username and password but there are definitely other many other factors that can play in authorization on the other hand is who or is what you can do so authentication is who you are authorization is what you can do so to go back to the offline example of the me presenting my id to the post office uh, clerk they uh, that might, um, once they've authenticated me, they might know that I have a PO box there or a mailbox there. And so they might, that might authorize me to get my mail. Notice that it doesn't authorize me to get anybody else's mail unless conceivably they have like a list of, um, someone else's like signed permission and giving consent for me to pick up their mail, right? Like Cody might do that if he's on vacation. And so the authorization step is kind of paired with the authentication stuff, but it's separate because um, you know you can authorize once you know who someone is, you can authorize them to do different things. In an online world, this tends to happen with either role-based access control, where people are assigned a role or they're added to a group that has a role, or they are um, there's something called ABAC, which is attribute-based uh, access control, which is looking at um, a number of different factors, who the person is, what the resource they're trying to access is. Finally, in auth, I also include user management. 
And this makes a lot of sense to wrap up into one thing because if you have information about how to identify a person and also what they can do, it makes sense that you might provision them as well, right? And say, okay, this is the person. In the offline example, um, the user management has really happened by the Department of Motor Vehicles or whoever grants me that ID. In the online world, it's often consolidated. But they can all be split apart too. You don't have to have they can uh, you don't have to have auth authorization, authentication, user management all handled by the same uh, identity server or uh, software component, but they often are. So let's go ahead and after we've kind of done that brief whirlwind of auth, defining auth, let's talk about common workloads and what uh, how auth interacts with those. So the three types of, you know, after I surveyed some folks and talked to some experts, the three types of applications that tend to be on Kubernetes were um, legacy monolithic apps, right? So you're just pulling over an application that, that runs someplace else, right? Maybe on bare metal or on a VM, you're pulling it into Kubernetes after containerizing it. An evolving monolith where it already exists on Kubernetes, but it is kind of, um, you're, you're trying, kind of trying to break things apart. And then finally, you have a microservices application, either one that exists on Kubernetes right now or that is on some other orchestration system that you're pulling over into Kubernetes. So let's talk about how auth interacts with each of these types of uh, applications or architectures. So first, we're going to talk about legacy. So here, you know what you're really doing is you're moving for efficiencies you are taking something that exists someplace else and you're containerizing it, you're wrapping it up and you're pulling it into kube. And the kind of efficiencies you can get, one is conceivably better hardware use, right? Because you may be running it on a VM that's oversized for what the application does. It may be spiky in usage. And so you might be able to leverage some of the um, lack, or sorry, the uh, slack that you have in a Kubernetes cluster for the spiky times and then have um, other applications use that same cluster for times when this application is not under high use. But a, a bigger probably efficiency is the operational efficiency of just having one way to deploy your application, one way to scale it, one way to um, upgrade it. And so those operational efficiencies, both in terms of kind of software you have to write because Kubernetes provides a lot of the plumbing for that, but also just the skills you have to have can be very powerful. So here's an example of what you might see, um, you know, just kind of a diagram of, of moving things into Kubernetes, right? So nothing fancy. We're just taking stuff and moving into Kubernetes. We're not modifying these applications at all. App one, app two, app three, remain the same, you know, they may be containerized, but um, they're not, we're not changing the source code or, or modifying functionality at all. So as someone who's been through a number of different migrations of applications, uh, I can say that migrating things is tough enough, right? It's tough enough to make sure you have all the dependencies right, make sure you understand your, your build pipeline correctly, make sure that you understand the new environment you're running in. So I wouldn't spend a lot of time thinking about making auth changes in this scenario. Um, maybe after you've pulled it on to Kubernetes, you could start to look at making some changes, adding single sign-on, extracting out your user um, data to a, a standalone data store. But if you're just doing legacy move um, from something else, some other environment to Kubernetes, I wouldn't spend a lot of time uh, stressing about auth. So let's talk about evolving the monolith. So this is a situation that is kind of a natural follow on, right? Like we've got the monolith on Kubernetes. Um, we're starting to think about breaking out services so we can take advantage of some of the, the flexibility that a uh, container-based orchestration system allows us to have. Um, in many cases, most applications I've encountered, user login, authentication, authorization is part of that application. And the nice thing about this is that it is also, uh, at least in terms of the authorization piece, uh, fairly standardized. And so they, that, that makes it a very um, good candidate to break out first because it's something that is critical to your application, but it also has like the standard interface, which is OAuth and OAC for modern applications. 
So we might have this application and let's just call it a to-do application. And uh, it will, we'll start to break out pieces, right? So we'll have a login service. We're going to break out and we chip that off of the, uh, the application. We might break out uh, a REST API to add or remove to-dos. And then we might also uh, take out, you know, a piece of functionality that's about reminding us, um, you know, so that we can very easily uh, go ahead and say, you know, someone adds it to do, we can say, okay, we're going to remind you about it 24 hours, 40 hours ahead of time. The point here is that we start to chip away at this application and we can do it all within kind of the Kubernetes uh, ecosystem. So if you're starting to look at this login service, right, this login service and thinking about breaking that out as, as one of the first steps you're breaking out of your application, one of the first services you are, you want to think about a couple of things. Um, first, I, I'm not sure I'd recommend building your own. Uh, there's a ton of open source libraries or commercial applications, Fusion Auth being one of them, that you can use to, to, to offer that service. So I think that your time is better spent uh, building these kind of unique pieces of functionality. The login service, again, because it's standardized, is pretty um, easy to kind of pop in uh, an out of the box solution. So this is definitely on the build versus buy spectrum. I would say this is on the buy side. And whether you're buying that with time, like with an open source solution or with money or, or with a combination of both. So you want to make sure this, whatever you choose is deployable as a container and, and it's fast because this is something that's going to be kind of a key like doorway to your application, but not something that people want to spend a lot of time on. You want to make sure it scales up to the number of users you're expecting. And you want to make sure that it's standards compliant, right? So you want to look for OAuth, OIDC support, uh, maybe SAML, depending on your use case, a lot of applications um, older applications or business type applications, especially have SAML interfaces and may not have OIDC interfaces. You want to make sure that it's API first and that it supports the tooling that you're going to use, right? Whether that's Terraform or Go, uh, Go uh, CLIs or something else, you want to make sure that it can be configured with APIs and in the manner that you are expecting. Otherwise, it's going to become something that's got a little bit of a, a unique special case, which you don't want. And then also, you want to make sure that you're aware of the pricing model. As I alluded to earlier, you can either pay in time or money or both. And, you know, a lot of open source solutions out there are um, free to implement. <laughs> and then you have to care, give them care and feeding. Uh, there are other solutions out there that may take a little bit less to get going and may be easier to move forward with. But you need to kind of pick the pricing model that works for you and just be very aware of, of what it is. Uh, I will say Fusion Auth is free for many uses. And we definitely have people running in Kubernetes as a login provider. All right. So we've talked about the legacy monolith, where we're just trying to get stuff onto Kubernetes. And we've talked about the evolving monolith, where we're taking things, functionality out of Kubernetes and how Auth interacts with that. So let's talk about a microservices application. It's tiny dishes. Um, I made a joke. Um, so existing microservices, we have a couple of different ways to think about auth for a microservices based application. And the first is tokens. And tokens are basically time bound credentials that are generated by somebody else that you don't have to worry about. And you can consume tokens at the boundary of your microservices application or a subset of it between it or a subset of functionality within it or between microservices. So if you have uh, that to do application we talked about and it needs to reach out to the reminder service, you could conceivably present a token to have it um, have the microservice authenticate itself. So here's an example of a uh, Again, a pretty simple application. And here we just have the client, which is a mobile device that's presenting a token, which is that gray circle to the ingress. 
and the ingress is going to examine that token, make sure that whatever request is coming in is both authenticated and authorized. Another option that you have with microservices is something called MTLS. And this is really good. Uh, basically, basically, this is like mutual transport layer security. So it's, it's certificates. Uh, the same way you have SSL certificates that are mostly served up by the server, you can actually have client certificates so that a client can present a certificate that is um, that it has been issued and that basically authenticates the client. And that's a kind of a level below uh, HTTP, below the application uh, code, where tokens tend to be passed around uh, in headers or in form bodies. And so they are uh, possibly query parameters, although that's a bad practice. Um, so they're really at that higher level of the network stack. So um, MTLS is a, is a good option. It tends to be used between microservices because it's a bit of a management problem. Uh, you have to issue certificates, you have to make sure they're deployed correctly and mobile apps, you know, it's, I don't wanna say always because they're definitely, it's definitely possible to deliver a client certificate to a mobile app, but mobile apps or other kinds of consumer applications, normal user applications don't tend to have uh, client certificates. Um, within in Kubernetes, you can use a service mesh or a sidecar to take care of that provisioning. And I've used um, Istio myself, played around with that, and that made it very easy to enable um, client certificates and enable MTLS between my microservices. So here's, a, again, a simple diagram where the to-do application, uh, or the to-do microservice is getting a uh, had some request or needs to do something and needs to reach out to the reminder service. Maybe it's uh, creating a reminder for a particular to-do or something like that. It's gonna present that certificate to the reminder service and that reminder service can now know who is making that request. So that's what takes care of the authentication, the authorization piece there. So let's go ahead and step into poll number one. And the question I'm going to ask you is, uh, which of these is not a workload that is typically moved to Kubernetes? So we're looking for something that is not going to be in, uh, not you're not gonna move to Kube. And we have legacy monolithic apps, um, an application that is evolving towards microservices architecture, a native iOS or Android application, or an existing microservice application. Like we should play the Jeopardy song. All right. So it looks like we have uh, most folks are, uh, our number of folks have voted and uh, the winner is uh, native iOS or Android applications, which is absolutely correct. They will absolutely, if you, if you have a native iOS or Android application, they will absolutely interact with a Kubernetes uh, cluster or applications running on such a cluster, but you wouldn't typically run one on there because they're gonna be running on the iOS or Android uh, operating system. All right, thank you for your participation. So let's talk about the different types or kinds of auth in Kubernetes. And this is something that when I was first looking at auth in Kubernetes, it kind of got me caught up. So I wanna make sure that everyone attending this webinar is super clear on this. So there's really three kinds um, we have in the cluster, which is really you are um, authenticating against Kubernetes, you are determining um, it, it, your role or permissions to determine what you can do to the Kubernetes cluster. Can you scale up the number of replicas? Can you examine the config map or a secrets store? Um, can you create pods? Can you destroy uh, deployments? Things like that. Then there are what I call request-driven. Uh, uh, sorry, what I call request-driven auth, which is where you have kind of that external client that is providing some kind of credentials somehow. And 
the Kubernetes cluster or the application running on top of it needs to validate that and make sure that this request or this user who this request represents has what they need and has access to what they need, but nothing else. And finally, there's the machine to machine solution uh, or, or situation where we have um, microservices that are communicating within the Kubernetes cluster, but they're still communicating at the application layer. So there's a beautiful picture of the uh, cluster galaxy. Let's go ahead and look at uh, in cluster authentication first. So within a Kubernetes cluster, um, again, as I mentioned, we're really controlling access to the cluster infrastructure. So we're not concerned with the application at all necessarily. And we're really thinking, um, you know, I mean, we're concerned with maybe deploying the application, but not uh, the functionality of the application. So we want to, you know, spin up a new version of our to-do microservice. We don't care about logging in to the to-do microservice to add a to-do. Uh, you want to win the situation, especially if you are looking at um, hosting uh, an IDP yourself as opposed to a SaaS solution or something else that is um, outside of your cluster. If you're, if you're hosting in your cluster, you want, you want to be very careful of that because if you are authenticating against uh, an IDP or an auth server that is running in your cluster and you somehow get to the point where you screw things up, then you might get to the point where you can't log into the cluster. Um, now, there are ways to provide multiple different authentication methods, and that's definitely a good idea. So that's one way around it. Another way around it is just have your identity provider hosted someplace else. You have, as I just alluded to, different authentication strategies available. You know, you can provide your own client certificates. You can uh, use token-based authentication uh, using OIDC or, or other kinds of authenticate other kinds of tokens um, there's even like a webhook based authentication where that you you can set up kubernetes to fire off a webhook and with some information and then when it comes back if it if the call succeeds then your login succeeds i'm going to say this is all very well documented in the kubernetes documentation and so if you actually google for kubernetes authentication this page is the first one that will come up I know because I've done it several times, so I'm not going to dig into this too much more. Because I think the, where auth gets really interesting is is talking about the applications, and at the application layer, you have a couple of of options. There are really two different categories, and um, the real question that you want to think about in terms of which type of authentication is going to work for you is: is the user present, or is the user not present, or and by user, I guess I mean some outside entity that needs access to your cluster and um, can basically gather a token or some other credential and present that to the cluster. So let's talk about the, the case where the user is present and they you know, flip their hand up and say, hey, um, I want access to this particular resource, right? I am trying to create a to-do in my application or trying to delete a reminder. So this is really kind of very request driven. So the user is authenticated elsewhere and that uh, they have a token based on that. Um, they uh, That token contains authorization information and authentication information. So here's an example of it. We have the mobile device which authenticates against an IDP and the IDP which stands for identity provider um, or login server or auth server, those are all basically synonyms. That IDP gives back a, a token. In this case, it's a JSON web token, but it could be any kind of token. We don't really care. All we care about is that the token's time bound and that the client has it. So the client is responsible for storing it safely. I have a whole other talk about that. We're not gonna talk about that today. So one kind of little side tangent is we don't really care about how the user is authenticated here. Right? That's the nice thing about this, this aspect is the identity provider can do whatever authentication it needs based on um, the client, the, the, the situation it's in, possibly the, the details of the request. It, you know, it could be with multiple factors. There could be like a, a SMS sent or a 
uh, push notification sent to the mobile device or some other scenario. Um, it could be something, uh, you know, they could be visiting their house or taking blood or, or something, right? We don't, we don't really care, like doing it via carrier pigeon. Um, it doesn't really matter to us. We don't care. All we care about is that the client ends up getting that token and storing it and be, is able to present it to our application. So the client has gone through this process. They have the, the uh, token and we then have them present it to us. Uh, the token is presented to the ingress because it's been stored on a client. Um, so that looks a little bit something like this, right? So the JOT is presented to the ingress. The ingress then validates that token. And it's very important that it validates in two ways. Uh, validates that the token is created by an identity provider or login server that it trusts. And then also looks at the claims of that token and says, oh, you know, this is this token is for me. This token is not expired. This token um, is uh, created by somebody that, that I know, right? Created by any provider I know. So that ingress needs to do all that validation. And then it can pass that token along to the microservice that was, that corresponds to the path that was requested by the client. And then that data gets pulled from the, the to-do microservice. Again, that's opaque to us. We don't really care how that happens. And then gets passed, the data gets passed back to the client where the client can render it as it sees fit. So I did say that the ingress needs to validate it and then the token, um, sorry, the, the microservice may need to validate, but uh, you can also have a service mesh validate as well. So conceivably you can have a sidecar that gets injected into Kubernetes and that sidecar can look at that JSON web token and validate various aspects of it without the to-do microservice needing to know anything about how to validate a, a JSON web token. I'm gonna talk about this a fair bit more in the um, latter parts of this presentation. So I'm gonna kind of move past it now. Uh, one thing that you need to be aware of is that you may need to have some way to get on behalf of semantics. And what does that mean? Well, that means that there may be a case where you are making a request of the to-do endpoint or the to-do microservice or you know the to-do functionality basically. And then that needs to make a follow-on request to a different microservice. So let's say that I create a to-do and I do it on one screen and it has, there's a little bit of UX that says, um, set a reminder for 24 hours before this to-do is due. So in that case, I'm gonna need to both make a request to the to-do um, microservice and to the, to the reminder microservice. One option is that I could absolutely make two different requests. The other is that I could have the to-do microservice make a request on my behalf to the reminder microservice, which is what I'm gonna show here. So we pass the token and then the token gets passed to the to-do microservice and then it, it gets passed along to the reminder microservice as well. And it's possible that that token gets reissued and we'll talk a little bit more about that in later slides. But that token is something that you wanna think about um, how you're going to handle this case because in this particular request, the to-do service is uh, not acting on its own, right? It's acting on behalf of the original user who made that request, but it is also acting on its behalf. So it's kind of, uh, you're basically making, there's two different principles in this scenario. And then the to do application can, or microservice can pass that back to the ingress, which can pass it back. So for request driven uh, authentication, basically it's all about the user and uh, the thing that is the person that is initiating, person or entity that is initiating that request. So let's talk about machine to machine authentication. And this is microservice to microservice in this particular scenario. But the whole point here is there's no user present. Um, we could have microservices call each other willy nilly and just trust in the network boundary, but that violates zero trust, which is the current buzzword, which basically means, you know, we want to make sure everybody is authenticated all the time or authorized all the time. As I mentioned, there's no user present. We can use 
a couple of different options. We can use tokens, API keys, which are basically kind of a degraded, simpler form of token, um, MTLS, or a combination of those three. So in this particular situation, the reminder uh, service might, you know, once a day, reach out to the to-do service and say, hey, give me all the to-dos that are due within the next week. And then I'm going to send out reminders based on, on those to-dos. And so there's no user present at all. This is driven by time or some other event, a cron job or whatnot. And, but we wanna make sure that the reminder service is properly authenticated to make that request against the particular to-do endpoint. So let's talk about MTLS a bit. I talked about it a little bit earlier, but it is does stand for Mutual Transport Layer Security. Uh, Within Kubernetes, you can have the certs be signed by a certificate authority, but you can also use self-signed certs, which is more typical and probably cheaper and easier to deploy. Uh, service messages, service meshes like Istio or Linkerd offer these out of the box. Really good option to consider. Uh, if you're using tokens, you probably want to use a secure token service, which is basically like a thing that can issue tokens inside your cluster and the thing you want to look for there is you want it to use the client credentials grant to issue it. Uh, so tokens will be issued on behalf of the, in the, in the case the, the example I showed, on, on behalf of the reminder service by the, um, so sorry, the reminder service knows it needs to do something, right? It knows it needs to go get the to-dos, as I mentioned earlier. So it's going to call to the secure token service and present credentials. And this will typically be a client ID and a client secret. And then the secure token service will issue a token that's good for you know a minute, 30 seconds, two minutes, whatever it is. And then that is presented to the to-do microservice. And so now the to-do microservice knows who is accessing it, right? And it knows that it's the reminder service, which means that it's okay for it to, it to call a list operation on the to-dos to get back a list of to-dos, but that if it if the reminder service or someone presenting that token of the reminder service tries to access something to create to-dos, it's gonna be denied. And then that data gets sent back to the reminder service. All right, so let's go ahead and do poll number two. And in this poll, the question is, what does MTLS stand for? And your options are mutual transport layer security, many, uh, that's option one. Option two is many teachers love sunshine. Option three is multi mutual token level security. And option four is multi-tenant location security. So what does MTLS stand for? All right, looks like most folks got uh, got it. It is, it does stand for Mutual Transport Layer Security, also known as Client Certificates. All right, let's go ahead and move on to how to implement RBAC using OIDC. And with this is within the Kubernetes uh, sphere. And so remember I talked about the three types of Kubernetes auth where one was um, in cluster, the next was request driven and the third was between different microservices. Well, this is an example of in cluster auth. So we're controlling access to um, different parts of your Kubernetes cluster. And this is using the ID token from the OIDC, from an OIDC login. So the ID token looks a little bit something like, well, this isn't the whole ID token. This is just the payload of the ID token, but it has uh, claims that basically say, hey, who is this from? 
Um, what's the expiration time? There's other things that happen here, but roles are an important piece here. So what are some things that you have to have to start with? So basically you need to make sure your OIDC server is already set up. And this, again, because you're using this for in-cluster authentication, you probably want this to be someplace else. So you want to make sure that your OIDC server supports OpenID Connect Discovery. And what that basically is, is basically uh, is a set of JSON documents at well-known URLs or well-known paths hosted by your OIDC server so that Kubernetes can find out things like where are the public keys. You need to make sure that you are running a modern version of TLS and you need to have a uh, signed certificate. And that, that certificate authority can be your own certificate authority. It doesn't have to be, a, again, a public one you have to pay money for, but you do have to have a certificate that's signed. You need to create roles for your users inside the OIDC server. And obviously you need to create users as well. And then you need to create what's called an OIDC client. And that is basically just an application. It's It's got a client ID, a client secret, and you need to have kind of created that before you even get started using this server to authenticate your Kubernetes users. So then once you have those prerequisites taken care of, you want to get started with a, a set of startup flags. And these are all things that you're going to need to set up for your Kubernetes cluster. Um, it's a lot, so I'm gonna go through them kind of one by one. The first is the authorization mode. And here is where you can say, hey, I want multiple different authorization modes. I kind of alluded to this earlier when I said you don't really want to have um, your IDP host on the Kubernetes cluster and control all your authentication because if things go sideways, you might be logged out, of, logged out of Kubernetes cluster. In this particular case, node authentication is, I think, used by Kubelets, and then RBAC is what we're interested in. We are also going to set an issuer URL. So this is basically saying, hey, where is where does our a login server live, right? Who is going to give me the ID token that I'm going to use to authenticate uh, and authorize my users? You need a client, an OIDC client ID, which is the client ID you previously set up. You need to map uh, from the claims in the ID token to um, things that, that Kubernetes understands, right? Usernames, groups. So in this particular case, we're taking the email claim and we're mapping it to the um, uh, username. And then we're also, excuse me, we're also prefixing it because what you want to have happen is like have usernames collide between these different authorization modes. So we're going to put OIDC in front of that. You could put Fusion Auth or um, external or whatever you wanted. We just want to prefix the names. And we want to do the same thing for the groups. So here it's saying we're taking the roles claim from the ID token and we're putting it into, uh, it's, we're going to map it into groups for our Kubernetes cluster. And then you also need the path to the, the certificate authority. And as indicated here, this is just a, a self-signed certificate. Uh, sorry, this is a self-managed certificate authority. The next step is to bind the roles. So here we're going to bind the OIDC at colon admin role, which comes from the ID token. And we're going to put everyone who has that, sorry, we're going to bind that group, right? So we've mapped from the admin role that comes in the token. We've turned that into the OIDC admin group. And then we are going to map, put everybody who is in that group into the cluster admin role. And this just happens to be a default role that is provided by Kubernetes, but you could absolutely use your own custom roles and you probably should. You probably shouldn't give everybody cluster admin. There are two, it's worth noting that there are two different kinds of roles that uh, you can use. Um, here we used a cluster role and that is good for kind of cross cluster access. So 
uh, when you have cluster admin, you have admin across an entire uh, cluster. You also can do namespaced roles, which again, these are Kubernetes roles. I feel like the word roles is overloaded a bit here because it's we have Kubernetes roles and we have OIDC roles. Anyway, um, so there are two different kinds. There's cluster roles and there's regular roles that are limited to a namespace. So the issue is that, uh, so you want to get the, now, now, we, now we've set things up. We've started up a Kubernetes cluster. Now let's go ahead and get the token. It's worth noting that there's no refresh grant supported by Kubernetes out of the box. So you end up using um, this third party solution, open source solution called Kublogin. And so you want to make sure you set that up. And then we are going to actually use OIDC, our credentials to log in um, with kubectl. And then we're gonna be able, able to issue, after we've run this and we've logged in with our identity provider, we're actually gonna be able to issue commands against the Kubernetes cluster. So we would be able to run a command, which this is just deleting a, an elastic search pod and but when we try to make that command, when we try to run that command, the first time we'll be prompted to lo actually log in at our identity provider. And then once we've done that, we get uh, we get the va the OIDC token in this cache, and then the command actually gets executed. And of course, Kubernetes being Kubernetes, it's going to recreate that Elasticsearch pod, so we don't have to worry too much about things. If you want to log out, you actually end up having to remove that OIDC login, like those cache credentials. So it is something to be aware of that it that it does kind of cache it on the um, in the uh, in this on the file system. Um, I suspect that Kube login lets you use refresh tokens, but uh, or no, I know that it lets you use refresh tokens, so you can continue to stay logged in. Um, depending on how your identity provider is configured, you may not actually. Um, be able to um, use a refresh token, or you may have to log in every day or every hour or something like that. That's really an identity provider uh, specific configuration. So let's go ahead and use poll number, th uh, hit up poll number three. And poll number three, the question is, what's the difference between a cluster role and a role in Kubernetes? So uh, the first option is there is no difference. The second is that cluster roles apply across an entire cluster. Roles only apply in a namespace. The third option is roles are only used within microservices hosted on Kubernetes. And the fourth, fourth is that roles work with MTLS and cluster roles work with tokens. All right, looks like most folks are voting for cluster roles apply across the entire cluster, which is the correct answer. All right. Okay, so let's talk about tokens, the context boundary, and I may scoot a little bit. I, I think we're running a little bit short on time. I wanna make sure there's time for questions. So the context boundary here is um, basically this golden dotted line. And I will say that you know, in this simple example demo application, um, we only really have one context boundary, but you'll probably have multiple within your applications if they're of any size. So the question is, what do you, when the client presents that JSON web token, what do we do with it? So you have four options. You can halt processing at the ingress, you can pass it through, you can reissue it, or you can extract claims and pass a subset of claims through. Let's look at each of those. So the first is when we halt the ingress, uh, the token's received and it's validated the ingress. And, and this is common across all these patterns. You always want to receive it and validate the ingress. Um, but in this pattern, you don't actually pass it along with the request as it, the request makes it way, its way to the microservice. So here's the diagram of it, gets passed to the ingress. The to-do microservice never sees the token, passes back the data. So when you're when you're uh, using this pattern, you basically have to have another authentication method. Uh, 
Uh, it does have the benefit of being low impact on the services, right? The to-do microservice didn't have to think about anything around auth, um, but the ingress validation is critical and the request itself has to contain everything the microservice needs. You won't, because you're not passing the token along, you can't rely on anything the token has like the user information or anything like that. Pass through is where we basically just take the token and just pass it right through. So here it's presented to the ingress. Again, it does its validation. And then the to-do microservice gets the token and examines it and validates it as well. Uh, this is a good candidate for a sidecar. Um, the data gets passed back. The microservices have to process the token. Uh, basically, that means that they are, if, if the token is signed with a uh, asymmetric key pair, you have to have access to the public key or to the issuer to get that key pair. Um, the loss logic either has to be in the service or in a sidecar. Um, the token is reused. The ingress is much simpler, right? It doesn't have to do anything. It just kind of um, passes it right through. Another option is what I call the reissue, where you're basically creating a new token that's a bit of a mirror of the other token, but it has different characteristics. So here we're going to pass the token through. We create a new token, which we can. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what how how that might be different. But that new token is what's passed to the to do microservice and validated there, then the data is passed back. So again, the microservices have to process the token, but that token can be, it can have different claims, it can have a different lifetime, it can have a much shorter lifetime, for example. You can use a symmetric signing algorithm, so you don't have to have access to any public key repository. Uh, the ingress has to do a little more work, right? It's a little more complicated, but, um, and then you end up doing having a little bit of business logic in the ingress, right? Especially if you're pulling off claims from one token and putting them in another, uh, depending on how you do that, I'd consider that to be business logic. The final option is the passing the subset. And so this is where you extract needed claims and then you ship them as a head, header or body parameter. So let's go and look at this. We pass the jot to the ingress. Again, you didn't tire me here, hear me say this, but the ingress needs to validate the token, <laughs> um, and then we basically uh, split apart the dot into um, values that we're putting in the header of the body, and we also have an API key. So the to-do microservice validates that the request came from the ingress via an API key, and then it looks in the header or the body to, for the values it needs, right? Like, for example, the user ID that it needs, it passes the data back. So microservices get simpler, right? They don't have to understand anything about processing tokens. The auth payload, depending on how much is in there, could be smaller. The ingress, again, gets more complicated because you have to have that logic to like parse apart the token. And again, it has business logic in it. So which of these four options should you pick? It really depends on what you're looking for, whether you're looking for ease of implementation or performance or backwards compatibility, right? Minimizing the impact on the, on the services or whether you want to leverage the token data and that rich uh, data that you can pass through in a token. So in conclusion, today you learned briefly what is auth. You learned the different kinds of workloads that you can pull on a Kubernetes, three kinds of auth, types of auth, right? That's in cluster, request driven and microservice to microservice authentication. We talked about how to implement, uh, how to leverage OIDC to create an, a token uh, to, to um, authenticate within Kubernetes, a Kubernetes cluster. And then we talked briefly about how to handle tokens at the boundary of your application context. So this is the time when you all get to ask me questions. Uh, and if you'd like to copy the slides, or uh, have other questions about FusionAuth or Kubernetes or authentication, uh, you can go ahead and reach out to us via these addresses. All right, Dan, so I'm looking through the questions we've received so far, but I'll take a second to remind our audience, please send in any questions you have, and this is the time to address them. So right, we'll start from the top. So which way is the best way to handle the token transformation when crossing the context boundary? Yeah, I guess I'd say the answer here is it, it depends. Um, I, I think that 
when you're, um, kind of depends on where you want the complexity, right? So if you, you could do it in a couple of different ways, you could do it at the ingress, you could do it in a sidecar, uh, that is distributed to all your applications. If you're using, um, a service mesh, or you could do it via a shared library and it's hard to give any definitive answers, but I think those are the three main categories that I would, I would look at. So how does a service mesh interact with authentication? Yeah. So service mesh can, can in a couple of ways, right? One is you can have a service mesh that doesn't care anything about the authentication at all. Right. And provides the other services that a service mesh might provide. Um, you can also enforce MTLS using a service mesh. So the service mesh in that case will be taking care of injecting the sidecar, making sure that the sidecar, which is probably Nginx or Envoy or something like that, has the proper TLS certificates and passes uh, requests from the sidecar to the, the, ho the main container. And then you would, at that point, configure... Um, you know, what is a lot, what services or what uh, Kubernetes um, deployments or other things are allowed to call which other ones. And that all happens kind of at the service uh, mesh layer, right? So you're basically writing a lot of YAML to configure the service mesh to say, okay, the to do, uh, the to do microservice can call the reminder microservice, but it can't call the, um, but the reminder microservice can't call the to do microservice. And you can get that down to like the path level. And then the third one is I've actually seen service meshes that can inspect a JSON web token. And so they can, they don't do it super complicated in a super complicated fashion, right? Like you can't like, um, as far as I've seen, you can't write super custom logic, but they can definitely check an audience or an issuer to make sure that those are, ex and, and expiration time to make sure that those are expected values. So those are the three ways that I've seen a service mesh interact with authentication. Thank you so much. Um, so this next question reads, where should I put my IDP if I'm using OIDC for RBAC access to my cluster? Yeah, so you definitely want to make sure that you um, have it either, you want to have it off the cluster, right? So it could be in another cluster that somebody else maintains. Uh, it could be a SaaS option. It could be something that's just running on a, a VM. You want to make sure that it's highly available because it's going to control access to your cluster and want to make sure that you don't end up kind of um, trying to lift yourself up by your own belt, right? Uh, if you run the IDP in, inside your Kubernetes cluster, um, then you might uh, screw things up. I mean, I guess for, for a dev environment or something that's not production, it's conceivable you could do it in a separate namespace. That might be enough isolation, but certainly for production, I would want it to be somewhere else. All right, so Dan, what is your opinion on open policy agent? Sorry, could you repeat that question? Yes, so what is your opinion on open policy agent? Yeah, so open policy agent, uh, for, for folks who don't know, is an open source way to uh, basically write authorization logic. And I believe it also, or there, there are some components that actually can read OPA that um, I think it's called a policy decision point. And it's part of like the zero trust framework. I think it's great. Um, I don't have any personal experience writing OPA myself. I know that some of our users have used it successfully, uh, but I think it, it's, um, it, how do I put this gently? Anytime you can move authorization logic or things that are like authorization logic out of code and into configuration, um, I think that it's a net win. Great. Um, so this is the last question we've received so far. Great. So hint hint to the audience, send in any questions you have at this point. Um, so in your opinion, which one is better, Service Mesh or Istio? So my understanding is that Istio is a service mesh, right? So there are multiple kinds of service meshes. There's um, Istio, there's Linkerd. I think there are some other ones out there. I would say that in general, um, anything you should start out by evaluating. And I believe those are both open source and under the CNCF. 
So I, th or I think Istio was applying to be under the CNCF, but I think both of them are probably better solutions than you writing your own sidecar. Um, but I will confess, I haven't done, um, I haven't used either of those in anger, right. Or, um, you know, done like significant, uh, how do I put this, um, testing, right. Like, so I would think about things like you're basically trading off a little bit of, kind of being more close to the metal. If you're running your own sidecars, you have a lot more configurability and, and control. With Istio, you get the benefit of the community, Istio or other open source solutions out there. Um, you get the benefit of the community, but you might have, um, you know, it's another layer of complexity, another thing you have to actually run that takes resources um, and is a source of, how do I put this, um, issues or bugs. So I think that Istio has enough functionality. Istio is the one I'm most familiar with. It has enough functionality that I would absolutely look at that if I was running an application on Kubernetes first and just see, because I think that like anything else, it's going to be harder to layer it in after you've already kind of got things going. Um, so I would definitely evaluate it early and see whether it meets your needs. Great. So it looks like we've exhausted all of the questions that are going to be sent in today. So Dan, how about I give you the floor one more time? Um, is there anything that you'd like to say to our audience? Any parting words before we close out? Sure. Cody. I, first of all, I always like to say thank you to any audience, right? I really appreciate all your time. And I do hope this was illuminating to you in terms of the different ways that authentication can interact with the Kubernetes application and the clusters that they run on. So thank you again for your time. Awesome. And Dan, thank you so much for joining us today. I'd like to remind our audience that this session was recorded. So you should be receiving an email with a link to access the recording on demand. You can also find the recording living on the Container Journal website. Just visit containerjournal.com slash webinars and be sure to look in the on-demand section. So I promised at the top of the hour to give away four $25 Amazon gift cards. So our four winners are Kelly B, Stanley B, Ian M, and Keith P. So to the four of you, congratulations. Please keep an eye on your inbox to claim that gift card. But if you don't happen to see that email, check your spam folder. Um, Dan, thank you so much for being here. I'd like to thank Fusion Auth for sponsoring today's webinar. And to our audience, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we really appreciate you spending time with us today. We ask for one extra moment to for you to fill out a brief post-webinar survey that should pop up on your screen here in just a moment. But otherwise, we hope to see you at an upcoming Tech Strong Learning webinar or workshop. Thank you all so much.